Section four of Ruth of Boston. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ruth of Boston, a story of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, by James Otis. Section four. Thanksgiving Day in July. The ship success which was also of our fleet, having been left behind when we sailed from England, came into the harbour on the 6th of July, and then it was, although our hearts were bowed down with grief because of the death of Lady Arabella, and the drowning of Henry Winthrop, that our people decided we should hold a service of thanksgiving to God, because of his having permitted all our company to arrive in safety. Word was sent to the people of Charlestown, and to those few men in the settlement which is called Dorchester, that they might join us in the service of praise, and many came to Salem to hear the preaching of Master Endicott, Master Higginson, and Governor Winthrop. Leaving Salem for Charlestown Four days later, which is the same as if I said on the 12th of July, the fleet of ships sailed out of Salem Harbor, with those of our people on board who could not bear the fatigue of walking, to go up to the new village of Charlestown. Before night was come, we were at the anchor, off that place where we believed the remainder of our days on this earth would be spent. Because of the labor performed by those men whom Master Endicott had sent to this place a year before, there were five or six log houses which could be used by some of our people, and the governor's dwelling, which of course would be the most lofty in the town, was partially set up. Yet the greater number of us did not go on shore immediately to live. Governor Winthrop remained on board the Arabella, as did my parents and Susan's, and now, because there is little of interest to set down regarding the building of the village, am I minded to tell that which I heard our fathers talking about evening after evening, as we sat in the great cabin when the day's work was done. To you, who have never gone into the wilderness to make a home, the anxiety which people in our condition felt concerning their neighbors cannot be understood. To us, if all we heard regarding what the savages might do against us was true, it was of the greatest importance we should know who were settled near at hand, if it so came that we were driven out from our town. OUR NEIGHBORS Now you must know that many years before, which is much the same as if I had said in the year of our Lord, 1620, a number of English people who had been living in Holland, because of their consciences not permitting them to worship God in a manner according to the Church of England, came over to this country, and built a town which was called Plymouth. This town was not far by water from our settlement. Indeed, one might have sailed there in a shallop, if he were so minded, and in case the wind served well, performed the voyage between daylight and sunset. It was, as I have said, settled ten years before we came to this new world, and the inhabitants now numbered about three hundred. There were sixty-eight dwelling-houses, a fort well built with wood, earth and stone, and a fair watch-tower. Entirely around the town was a stout palisade, by which I mean a fence made of logs, that stand eight or ten feet above the surface and placed so closely together that an enemy may not make his way between them, and in all respects was it a goodly village, so my father declared. Near the mouth of the Nepenset River, Sir Christopher Gardner, who was not one of our friends in a religious way, had settled with a small company, and farther down the coast, many miles away, it was said were three other villages, but none among them could outshine Salem, either in numbers of people or in dwellings. When we were on the shore in Charlestown, looking straight out over the water toward the nearest land, we could see, not above two miles away, three hills which were standing close to each other, and Master Thomas Graves, who had taken charge of the people that first settled in the town of Charles, had named the place Tri-Mountain, but the Indians called it Shawmut. There only one white man was living, and his name was Master William Blackstone, as I have already told you. It seemed to me a fairer land, because of the hills and dales, 
than was our settlement, and yet it would not have been seemly for me to say so much, after our fathers and mothers had decided this was the place where we were to live. GETTING SETTLED The days which followed our coming to Charlestown were busy ones, even to us women folks, for there was much to be done in taking the belongings ashore, or in helping our neighbors to set to rights their new dwellings. The great house, in which Governor Winthrop would live, was finished first, and into this were moved as many of our people as it would hold. Then again there were others who, not content with staying on the Arabella, after having remained on board of her so long, put up huts like unto the wigwams made by the Indians, which, while the weather continued to be so warm, served fairly well as places in which to live. If I said that we made shift to get lodgings on shore in whatsoever manner came most convenient for the moment, I should only be stating the truth, for some indeed were lodged in an exceeding odd and interesting fashion. Susan's father, going back some little distance from the great house, cut away the trees in such a manner as to leave four standing in the form of a square, and from one to another of these he nailed small logs topped with a piece of sailcloth that had been brought on shore from the Talbot, finishing the sides with branches of trees, sticks, and even two of his wife's best bed-quilts. Into this queer home Susan went with her mother, while my parents were content to use one of the rooms in the great house, until father could build for us a dwelling of logs. End of section 4